Okay. Lunch, so we'll, but you can start. Yeah. Okay, we'll start. And um, well, thank you for being here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. All no, right. We're gonna let Evan do his lecture now. Okay. And uh, the masks are back, unfortunately. I would be the, 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 the masks are back. So anyway, thank you for coming uh, today. And uh, it is December tenth. And on December 10th, 1941, America was in its third day of war. This is a talk about 1942, three weeks, three and a half weeks after Pearl Harbor. 1942, America is at war. In February, the internment camps, the internment of the Japanese starts. That is my wife. That is a place called Camp Shanks. Camp Shanks is in Orangetown, New York. It's right across the river here. Go across the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge, go about four miles south, Camp Shanks is where, and this is my 1943 talk, 700,000 men and women were at Camp Shanks, uh, went through Camp Shanks, a good many of them uh, were at D-Day and in Europe and in uh, North Africa. And that's my wife there with a wax uniform. Uh, automobile makers had to change, no more cars. They had to do something else. Everybody had to chip in for the war effort. And uh, 1942 was the start of rationing. Also, war bonds. Somebody has to pay for the war. War bonds. There is a war in Eastern Europe. There is a war in the Pacific. And the Manhattan Project starts. Uh, the Manhattan Project starts. That would be ultimately lead to the formation of an atomic bomb. Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. But it could, should come as no surprise that Pearl, Pearl Harbor should be under attack at some point. Because going back to the 1840s, 1840s, America decided Hawaii should be America. And that is going to be the spot in the Pacific that the United States was going to control its destiny from in terms of wars and other things. Uh, the United States would finally annex uh, Hawaii around 1900. It would become a territory. Shortly after that, they looked at uh, this uh, inlet, this little channel uh, called Pearl Harbor. It's, that's perfect for the military. Spent about $3 million in straightening out the channel, put the Navy in Pearl Harbor, the United States territory, going back to the 19-teens. So, it's Jan January 1st, uh, 1942. Now, you said you were eight or nine years old, right? 1942? How many of you were, were around on January 1st, 1942? So, while we talk, you could tell me about your experiences. I've had people tell me about their experiences in the last week in Brooklyn, collecting stamps for uh, war bonds, planting victory gardens, among other things. So America's in its 24th day of fighting on January 1st, 1942. Uh, it's more than two years since Germany had invaded Poland. Uh, that war started on September 3rd, 1939, and involved the English Commonwealth along with France, but America stayed out. They weren't involved. There was also another war going on at the time between Japan and China and Korea. Uh, so the Americans know at some point they are going to be involved in this war. question is when. Well, the Japanese, um, there was a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th. Much of the United States naval fleet was damaged or destroyed. 2,400 Americans were killed. And here's another picture of Pearl Harbor uh, after the attack. How many ships did they sink? They sunk seven, but I get to that in a minute. The attack started at 7.48 in the morning in Oahu, Honolulu, which was 12.48 in the afternoon in New York. Uh, over the years, I've talked to people about what New York was like the day of Pearl Harbor, including the owner of the New York Giants, I covered sports, Wellington Mara. Giants playing a home game at the Polo Grounds. All of a sudden, there's this announcement, will all physicians in attendance please report to a certain gate? Wellington Mara was a young kid at the time. 
he said that um, he didn't know what it meant. Well, what it meant was they got early word that Pearl Harbor was attacked. Uh, of course, that was on uh, CBS radio, John Daly, uh, Pearl Harbor has been attacked. There was a New York Rangers hockey game that was on against the Montreal Canadiens on Channel 1, WNBT in New York, now Channel 4, and they interrupted that to announce that Pearl Harbor was attacked. The base was attacked by 353 Imperial Japanese fighter planes, bombers, uh, and torpedo planes in two waves. And uh, six aircraft carriers uh, ca uh, were hit. All eight U.S. Navy battleships were damaged, um, four of them sunk. All but the USS Arizona were later raised, and six of them returned to service as the war went on. Franklin Roosevelt, what was he doing December 7th, 1941? Well, it's funny you should ask, because I asked him when I was up at Hyde Park. He and Eleanor were, they, they were nice hosts. If you look at them, they're all smiles, right? And they have some books for you, a little stiff, didn't have much to say. But I went up there because I had some things I wanted to talk to him about, uh, including the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Uh, Berlin Olympics, uh, basically legitimized the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler, called the Hitler Olympics. And I worked with Marty Glickman back in the late 1980s at his uh, broadcasting school. And he was supposed to run in the 1936 Olympics as part of a relay team. And um, I once said to uh, Marty after I said, you know, Roosevelt gave the okay. He didn't think athletes should be involved uh, in policy making. And it legitimized the Nazi regime. Was he right or wrong? Now, Marty never competed in the Olympics. He and Sam Stoller, who I also knew, who ran the Milrose Games, were pulled out by Avery Brundage um, and weren't able to run because they were afraid, the United States team, that these two Jewish guys, one of them from Brooklyn, the other from New York, Marty's autobiography was the fastest kid in Brooklyn. He was 18 and was the fastest kid in Brooklyn. Would have won gold medals, and that would have embarrassed the Fuhrer. Uh, so he told me, and he condemned Avery Brundage every day of his life for stealing his opportunity to win a gold medal. He said there were about four or five other Jews, besides Sam, that were from the United States competing for the U.S. Olympic team in 1936. He said it was the right decision. Well, that decision actually legitimized Adolf Hitler. There were about 50 nations that went to the 1930, uh, six World uh, Olympics, and uh, Hitler became more emboldened after that because he saw, hey, look, we're, we're nice Nazis during the Olympics, but as soon as the Olympics were over, they showed their true colors. Uh, also, Roosevelt was the first on TV in 1939, welcoming people to the New York World's Fair. And later on, 1942, he does something with baseball for the good of the morale of the country, and I got answers to all of that. But getting back to December 7th, so it's early afternoon. Franklin Roosevelt is meeting with his chief foreign policy aide, Harry Hopkins, and he gets a telephone call from the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. Pearl Harbor has been attacked, and this is a major, major deal. The United States and Japan had had some negotiations in 1941. Allegedly, this is a surprise attack. Uh, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he's done meeting with uh, his military advisors, and Franklin Roosevelt calmly and decisively dictates to his secretary, Grace Tully, a request to Congress to declare war. Why Congress? It's pretty simple. Congress has the power to declare war. The president cannot declare war, although the, the, uh, the Gulf War, the subsequent invasion of Afghanistan, the Iraq War, uh, weren't exactly approved by Congress. That was presidential fiat. But back then, the Congress did have to declare war. So here it is. It's December 8, 1941. It's a Monday. And Roosevelt goes before Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Japan. Calls December 7th, a date which will live in infamy, and told the U.S. Congress that the nation was in grave danger. That's uh, a bust of FDR up in Hyde Park, a date that will live in infamy. How many of you remember the, 
him saying that. You were there? You were there? No, but the all radio. of us here. The radio. You heard it on the radio back then. You heard it on the radio. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Congress voted to go to war. Everybody in Congress except one woman. Uh, her name is Jeanette Rankin. She was a member of Congress before your mother voted in 1920. She was a member of Congress in 1916. She voted against World War I in 1917, American participation in World War I. She voted against participation in World War II. And fast forward here for a second to January 19, 1968. Vietnam is raging at that point. Lots of demonstrations. There's a big demonstration on the mall in Washington, D.C., the Jeanette Rankin Peace Rally. So she was consistent over her uh, more than 50 years in the Congress. This would end uh, the isolation policy that the Americans had, and America went to war. Pearl Harbor, anybody been to Pearl Harbor? I've been there three times, but then again, I speak on cruise ships, or I've been in the business that has sent me out to Hawaii. Um, and the thing that gets me is oil is still seeping up to the top. You see the oil just seeping up all these years, decades, decades later. Uh, the territorial governor of Hawaii declared martial law, and all authority was turned over to the military, which proceeded to remove persons from military-sensitive areas, set curfews, regulate night driving, censor newspapers, radio broadcasts, and control prices on everything from groceries to prostitutes. Got a question about prostitutes for you. Um, aren't they independent contractors? Yes. Yeah, they're freelancers, right? Can't they set their own prices? Um, it depends. It depends. And also the other thing is do they pay taxes? Ooh. Do they declare their money? Do they declare tax? How do you set wage and price uh, wage controls on prostitutes? Some prostitutes said two bucks. You know, how are they gonna know? How are they going to know? Anyway, civil courts were closed. Writ of habeas corpus was suspended. How many now? I have all women in here. Just pointing this out. There are all women in here. There's not one man in here. So I'm going to ask this question, and I am going to get back from some of you. Who's he? Hank Greenberg. How many of you remember Hank Greenberg? Hank Greenberg, the great baseball player from James Monroe High School in the Bronx. Uh, he went to the same high school as my mother-in-law. He graduated 10 years prior to her and, uh, and back in the day. But anyway, Hank Greenberg re-enlists in the Army very quickly. Uh, he was discharged from the Army around December 5th because he was over the age of 28. Pearl Harbor is bombed, and within uh, two days, uh, Hank Greenberg uh, says, I want to go back. He voluntarily re-enlists. Uh, and he requests uh, to go into the Army Air Corps. He was not the only one ready to fight for his country. I knew his son, Steve Greenberg, Stephen Greenberg. He was the Deputy Commissioner of Major League Baseball. And we were talking about uh, a whole bunch of things about his father one day. And uh, I said, uh, he went back. He said, yeah. He said, when he was playing baseball, after it became obvious what, was hit, what Hitler was doing to systematically take the rights away from all Jews in Germany, every time he went up to the plate, he was not a religious Jew. He was a secular Jew, ethnic Jew, but not a religious Jew. He said every time he went up to bat, when the pitcher released the ball, all he saw was the face of Hitler on the baseball, and he wanted to smack the baseball as hard as he could. He was back. He was the first Major League Baseball player to enlist in World War II. On December 11th, which is tomorrow, December 11th, it is the 80th, uh, 81st anniversary of Germany and Italy and their declaring war on the United States. Uh, the Germans and the Italians uh, upheld their promise. If anything happened to Japan with the U.S., they would go to war with America. And America quickly is involved in this war that they had been preparing for, but were not re yet ready. So you've got to build a war machine. 
And how do you build a war machine? Well, you got the military, but you also have the civilian component. People like you who were kids back in 1942. Americans needed to quickly uh, train and raise and outfit a vast military force. Same time, had to continue to give military, uh, rather material, to Great Britain and the Soviet Union, who are fighting the war in Europe. And it wouldn't be the Soviet Union who would do most of the heavy lifting in World War II in Europe. So you got to build a war machine, right? So you got to meet challenges, which means you're going to spend a lot of money, government money, and existing industries like automakers, no more cars, you're going to start building us tanks. Uh, you got to build new factories. You have to tell people they have to change what they consume, whether it's material goods or even food. Uh, and there would be many restrictions on all aspects of American life. Government, industry, and labor would need to cooperate. And the contributions would come from everybody. They'd come from the young. They'd come from the old. They'd come from babies. Uh, they'd come from men. They'd come from women. They'd come from whites. They'd come from blacks. 1941, June 25th, 1941, A. Philip Randolph, civil rights leader, meets with Franklin Roosevelt six days before a scheduled civil rights rally in Washington, D.C. Randolph said, hey, why, why us? Why are Negroes not allowed to work for the defense industry or contractors? They were going to have a rally. Roosevelt signs an executive order allowing uh, blacks to uh, work with the military and contractors. Loyal Negro Americans want to help out. So you're building a war machine, and uh, you can't see this very well, but this Japanese guy has the buck teeth and the glasses and all. Remember December 7th. Not quite as good as remember the May, but keep America free. Primary task uh, in 1941 facing America was raising and training a credible military force. Roosevelt and Congress uh, authorized the first peacetime military draft in September 1940. By December 7, 1941, the American military had grown to nearly 2.2 million soldiers, sailors, uh, airmen, and marines. But there was still a need for more. And there was a need for more if they needed women. Women to do little things like answer telephones, because the men are out on the front lines. The Women's Army Corps, or the WAX, uh, was created as an auxiliary uh, I, and uh, was created as an auxiliary uh, uh, unit. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps on May 15th and converted to active duty status in the Army of the United States. There were 800 women who went to train in Iowa at uh, the Fort uh, Des Moines Provisional Army Officers Training School. Now, I got a question for you. Maybe you can answer this. What do you need more aptitude for? Working a telephone switchboard or fixing a tank? What do you, who, who, would, who would you pick? Would you pick the brightest to fix the tank? Or would you pick the brightest to work the telephones? What do you think? Well, I'm going to answer it. I'm going to answer it. Uh, the brightest were picked to work the switchboards. They were, uh, were, they were the ones who worked the switchboards. Uh, the WAX uh, was first trained in three major specialties. The brightest and nimblest were trained as switchboard operators. Next came the mechanics. They were second in intelligence, who had a high degree of uh, mechanical aptitude and problem-solving ability. I would think they would be first, but they were second. The bakers were the lowest uh, scoring recruits. The waves. The waves. She's helping to win. How about you? The waves. The waves. Where women accepted for volunteer emergency services were established by the United States Congress, signed into law by Franklin Roosevelt during July. The establishment of the waves made it easier for the Navy to fill clerical and office roles at home in shore stations while allowing the men to return to sea duty. Civilians, you have a role now. You have a role. 
Well, people who are still working at the Chrysler plant aren't turning out cars anymore. They're turning out tanks. The American economy had to be converted to war production. Millions of men and women entered the service, which meant changes in American life. The need for labor uh, opened new opportunities for women. Women could go to work until the end of the war, and then they were sent back home. African Americans and other minorities. America at war. A card. Oh, you remember that. On the, windshield. On the windshield of the car, you could get three gallons of gas. You could get three gallons of gas. America at war. Don't you know there's a war going on? It was a common expression. Rationing became part of everyday life. Americans learned to conserve vital resources. Americans live with price controls, dealt with shortages of everything, from nylons. They were telling me that uh, the other day, some woman was telling me that her mother used to draw a line on the back of her stockings, making believe it was nylons. Uh, to housing, volunteering for jobs ranging from air raid wardens. You'd be surprised, I've given this talk all week, you'd be surprised how many women were air raid wardens around the New York area and uh, Red Cross workers. Here was your ration card in your envelope. Uh, even babies had rationing cards. Even babies. Um, in May, the U.S. Office of Price Administration froze prices on practically all everyday goods, starting with sugar and coffee. With ration books and tokens, uh, they, well, ration books and tokens were issued to each American family. They told you how much gas you could get, how many tires you could get, how much sugar you could get, meat, silk, shoes. You were down to one pair of shoes a year. One pair of shoes a year. Nylon and the other uh, items only one person could buy. A wartime edition cookbook. The American Women's Cookbook contained revised recipes and gave advice on dealing with food shortages. Hey, Donald Duck had a victory garden. How many else had victory gardens? How many of you remember victory gardens? Where'd you come from? We didn't have one. We didn't have a John Well, this guy the other day was telling me, he says, you grew up in Brooklyn. I said, only a tree grows in Brooklyn. He said, no. He said, you know when they knock down houses, it'd be empty lots? He said, we'd clean up the empty lots and it would become a victory garden. So uh, there's Donald Duck, and he's telling the Nazi, uh, the, the Nazi uh, pest, keep out, Donald Duck. To conserve and produce more food, uh, Food for Victory campaign uh, was launched. Eating leftovers became a patriotic uh, duty. Uh, it's just not Thanksgiving. It was every day. You should eat some leftovers. Uh, civilians uh, were urged to grow their own vegetables and fruits, millions of victory gardens. Uh, planted and maintained by ordinary citizens, appeared in backyards, vacant lots, and public parks. Make do or do without. Do with less so they'll have enough. Everything has to go to the military. Everything has to go to the military. Make do or do without. War production created shortages of critical supplies. Uh, to overcome these shortages, uh, war planners searched for substitutes. Uh, for instance, copper. Copper was in very limited supply because they needed it in war-related uh, action, uh, including assault wire. Uh, the military needed millions of miles of this wire to communicate on battlefields, so copper was one thing you had to do with that. Uh, the military needed more than guns, and the ammunition steward's job needed food, but it depended on you to help them. Uh, they had to be fed. The Army's standard K-ration uh, included chocolate bars produced in huge numbers. Cocoa production was increased to make this possible. Sugar was another ingredient in chocolate. Sugar was rationed to civilians. Cigarettes, on the other hand, they, they had more than enough cigarettes. Uh, more than enough cigarettes. That was not a problem. How many of you would like to ride around on wooden tires? <laughs> Wooden tires. Well, it became an option because rubber was not available. 
Uh, the American military needed millions of tires for uh, jeeps and trucks and other vehicles, and the tires made out of rubber. Rubber was also used to produce tanks and planes. But rubber becomes a rubber, there's a rubber shortage because the Japanese Imperial Army controlled the Dutch West Indies uh, from March 1942 until they surrendered in September 1945, creating a shortage of rubber that affected American production. Speed limits, speed limits, can go over a certain uh, speed limit. Gas rationing, you had to limit your driving. 17 states east of the Mississippi, you got just three gallons a week, which translated to about 45 miles a week. That's all you were allowed to drive. Uh, this also reduced wear and tear on tires. The synthetic rubber industry was created. The public was also told to carpool. And if you have any rubber, contribute it or think about recycling it because we need it for scraps. I don't know how many of you remember your war ration book number one. Remember it? You yeah, remember it? You were little kids, but you got a ration book, right? Little kids. The United States government created a system of rationing, limiting the amount of certain goods that a person could purchase. The war also disrupted trade, limiting the availability of some goods. And some of your parents went to a store like this, because there were a lot of the little grocery stores. You handed in your ration card, gave the guy some money, and he gave you pears and and peas and whatever else uh, she was buying at the time. Americans received their first ration cards in May. The first card, war ration card number one, became known as the sugar book. For one of the commodities Americans could purchase was sugar with their ration card. So Roosevelt warned you, he said American life's going to change, at least that's what he told me there. Well, he's kind of he kind of mentioned it to me uh, when I was up there. Uh, on January 1st, sales of all cars and as well as delivery cars to customers who had purchased them. Uh, they were all frozen by the American government's uh, Office of Pro Production Management. And here's how things are evolving. January 10th, the freeze order uh, is amended to permit the sale of cars to the following categories. Oh, yeah. Army, Navy, U.S. Marines, Commission, uh, Panama Canal Zone, and other certain government agencies. Also, if you had a 181J or higher preference rating, uh, you could get a car. Uh, contractors with the Army, Navy uh, could also uh, get uh, cars with that kind of uh, rating. So you made tanks, not cars. And tanks were made. Automakers not only built tanks, but there were trucks and airplanes and jeeps and torpedoes and helmets. Factories were stripped down to make way for new equipment, and many car parts were remelted at steel mills to use in the war effort. I don't know how many of you remember a poster like this, but it said, wanted for victory, waste paper, oil rags, scrap metals, old rubber, get in the scrap, sell to a collector, or give to a charity. Come on, scrap days, scrap days, scrap days, help us out, help us out. In October, the United States government increasingly encourages U.S. citizens to donate and gather scraps and fabrics for the war effort. Scrap days, anybody remember scrap days back in then? Scrap days are held throughout the country and ask ordinary people to take any scrap materials they could get their hands on, take it to the local scrap merchant. The scrap would then be used to create the materials needed to build tanks, guns, ships that were desperately needed. I told you I'd go up to uh, see Franklin Roosevelt and um, got to ask him about baseball. How many baseball fans are here? Any? Any baseball fans? No baseball fans. Okay, that's fine too. Baseball was so woven into the American culture. You were a baseball fan? I knew a man who made a fortune in baseball. Oh, cards. baseball, baseball cards. Anyway, baseball is so interwoven in the American culture. There was Casey at the bat, which school kids had to read. Take me out to the ball game, still sung today. Uh, and that is now, uh, what, uh, 114 years after the song was written. 
Who's on first? What's on second? All of this. Yes? My name is Casey, and everybody calls me Casey at the Bat. But what is that? Casey at the Bat was a poem about a guy back in the 1888 or so, uh, written uh, by Ernest Thayer, who has a chance to win a baseball game, playing for the Budville Nine, gets up in the bottom of the ninth inning, bases loaded, has a chance to win the game, and he strikes out. Oh. It's all about man's failure. That's what my English teacher, Miss Alexander, told me back in 1965. It's a throwaway poem, but it's part of the baseball. It's part of the baseball. It's part of the American culture. Anyway, so that's uh, the baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And uh, baseball had stopped playing in 1918. They cut the, world, uh, the season short, played the World Series because of World War I. And Landis, and like a lot of other people running industries, trying to figure out, well, this is an entertainment industry. What are we supposed to do? On January 14th, uh, Landis uh, didn't know if baseball should plan for the 1942 season. There were 16 major league teams, about 300 minor league teams. And he sends a letter to Franklin Roosevelt asking for guidance. And here is the letter that was sent to Roosevelt. If you believe we ought to close down for the duration of the war, we're ready to do so immediately. If you feel we ought to continue, we would be delighted to do so. We await your order. There was never an order given. It was Roosevelt's personal opinion. There was never Roosevelt saying, play ball or don't play ball. FDR responds, this thing is called the green light letter. It sits in Baseball's Hall of Fame. There's also a copy of this up in Hyde Park at, um, at Roosevelt's Presidential Library. The green light letter. I honestly feel it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. Baseball provides a recreation which does not last over two hours or two and a half and which could be gotten at very little cost. Incidentally, I hope that night games could be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. Roosevelt thought that by keeping baseball going, it would be good for the morale of the country. Uh, this has to be in the Pacific Northwest. My daughter lives in Seattle, and at this time of year, it gets light about 8 o'clock in the morning, and as we go into January, it gets light around 8.30. Could be Alaska as well. Uh, more than likely not the east coast of the United States. This has to be in the winter, 5 a.m. till dawn daily. Blackout. Anybody lived through blackouts? Did you live through a blackout back in the 1940s? People have told me that they've lived through a blackout, and basically all the lights are shut, you had blackout curtains, and basically it was to keep German planes from knowing what was going on, even though the German planes could never reach uh, the United States. Officials in some American coastal cities uh, along the Pacific, in the Atlantic, were well aware of their vulnerability to air attacks and began ordering practice blackouts well before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. May, on March 8, 1941, Seattle became the first major American city to test its blackout procedures. You can't see this back there, but this is the St. Louis skyline, St. Louis skyline with all the lights, and this is the skyline, it's pitch black. Uh, during the practice blackout, and it's the St. Louis blackout drill. It was December 14th, St. Louis had the, its first blackout of World War II, and German planes were not equipped to fly across the Atlantic, the Japanese planes couldn't fly across the Pacific, and St. Louis is right in the middle of the country. So more than likely, St. Louis wasn't going to get bombed, but they prepared for the worst. How many of you remember Ebbets Field in Brooklyn? Ebbets Field, right? There's Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. One of the first baseball, major league baseball parks to get lights. Well, it's 1942 in New York, and office buildings and apartment houses throughout the city are required uh, to veil windows more than 15 stories high. Stores, restaurants, bars tone down their exterior lighting. Street lamps and traffic signals had their wattage reduced, 
And a woman was telling me before I even got to this, she said they used to put hoods on the lights of cars, uh, on the lights of the cars. So you couldn't really see that they had their lights on driving at night. Night baseball was banned. Night baseball was banned. Yankee Stadium, Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field, couldn't play night baseball. The Statue of Liberty's torch did not glow. Meanwhile, everybody was encouraged to buy war bonds. War bonds. Bonds were available in denominations of $25 to $1,000, but they were designed to be affordable to everybody. For $0.10, cents, for $0.10, cents, people could purchase stamps, which could be placed in albums. When you filled up the album, you could redeem it for a war bond. Uh, a couple guys this week told me that they love putting their stamps in the books, and they were kind of upset that they had to hand in their stamp book, but they got a war bond instead. So they were very popular with the children. In New York, there were two television stations that were on. WNBT Channel 1, which is now WNBC TV Channel 4, and WCBW TV Channel 2, now WCBS. In fact, on December 7, 1941, Channel 1 broke into the programming. The program was a Montreal Canadian New York Rangers hockey game to announce that Pearl Harbor was attacked. At night, at the Grand Central Terminal Studios, Channel 2 had a show on Pearl Harbor. On April 1st, the U.S. Uh, War Production Board halted the manufacture of television and radio equipment for consumer use. February 13th, the Federal Communications Commission, the minimum programming required of TV stations was reduced from 15 hours a week to four. But there was a propaganda arm, the Office of War Information, because the Americans needed to tell their people and others about what was going on in the war. That was created on June 13, 1942, Executive Order 9182 by Roosevelt. Through radio broadcasts, newspapers, posters, photographs, films, and other forms of media, the OWI was the communication between the battlefront and communities. Uh, the office also established several overseas branches, uh, which launched a large-scale information and propaganda campaign abroad with the Voice of America. The Voice of America was radio programming. Uh, it began during February, and the programming established World War II propaganda, uh, was established as a World War II propaganda tool that would broadcast the news of the war in an effort to fight against Nazi propaganda to help boost the morale of the American people and the Allies abroad. Oh. Internment camps. Japanese. Japanese, yep. Yeah, the internment camps. Well, there were internment camps both in the United States and in Canada. After all, Canada had been fighting the war since September 3rd, 1939. February 19th, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, stated intention preventing espionage uh, on American shores. Military zones created in California, Washington, Oregon, they have large uh, populations of Japanese Americans. Uh, Roosevelt's executive order forcibly removed Americans of Japanese ancestry from their homes, most of them American citizens. And that is what an internment camp looked like. You took whatever belongings you had and you lived in that kind of uh, barrack type place. In all, about 120,000 Japanese Americans 70,000 of them citizens were in turn. Meanwhile, Canada, Canada's a little different. Canada has been looking to throw out South Asians, Chinese, and Japanese since the end of the uh, 19th century, the 1880s, 1890s. And they have their opportunity to do so now. Uh, after Canada's declaration of war on Japan on December 8, 1941, Many called for the uprooting and an internment of Japanese Canadians under the Defense of Canada regulations. Since the arrival of Japanese, Chinese, and South Asian immigrants in British Columbia, or to British Columbia in the late 1880s, there had been calls for their exclu exclu exclusion. And there are the Japanese Canadians uh, leaving, going to internment camps. 
Uh, that happened February 25th, about a week after the Americans. Uh, Canadians, uh, Japanese Canadians, uh, were being moved for reasons of national security and were stripped of their homes, businesses, then sent to internment camps and farms in British Columbia as well as some other parts of Canada. Uh, the policy included uh, the theft, seizure, and sale of property belonging to Japanese Canadians and included fishing boats, motor vehicles, houses, farms, businesses, personal belongings. Japanese Canadians uh, were forced to use uh, proceeds of forced sales to pay for their basic needs during the internment. Really, I haven't talked about the war yet, right? And I am 45 minutes into this talk and I haven't talked about the war, have I? Well, there was a war going on, but people don't necessarily talk about what was going on at home. Because people at home had to maintain homes. The war starts for the Americans, and they don't fare very well. Meanwhile, the Germans begin to get a bit afraid of what is going on. On January 20th, the Nazis at the Wannsee Conference at Berlin decide that the final solution to the Jewish problem is relocation and later extermination. But the Germans needed laborers, like him. That cow. That cow. Six million. The incarceration of increasing numbers of people in concentration camps assured the quality of uh, quantity of uh, labor supply, even the, though there's the brutality of life inside the camps that depleted uh, available laborers. If you were weak, they kill you. Weed out. If they were weak, they're going to kill you. They only kept the strong because they needed them for slave labor. The SS used gas chambers and other means to uh, weed out prisoners who were no longer able to work. Meanwhile, the Americans get off to a rather poor start in 1942 in February. The Allies' attempt to intercept the Japanese uh, invasion fleet was defeated in the seven-hour Battle of the Java Sea on February 27th. Five Allied warships uh, were lost and only one Japanese destroyer damaged. Japanese landed at three points on Java Island on February 28th and rapidly expanded their beachheads. On March 9th, 20,000 Allied troops in Java surrendered. Japan took over the United States territory of Guam, the English territory of Hong Kong, Wake, Singapore, American territory, Philippines. Uh, the Japanese initial war plans were realized with the capture of Java. But they hoped that Americans would capitulate and that Americans would surrender immediately. It doesn't happen. General MacArthur leaves the Philippines. I shall return. Um, Roosevelt gets him out of there. He abandons the island fortress of Corregidor under orders from Roosevelt. He leaves behind 90,000 American and Filipino troops. The Filipinos were American citizens who lacked food, supplies, and support would soon succumb to the Japanese offensive. The Bataan Death March. The Bataan Death March takes place. Uh, forcible transfer by the Imperial Japanese Army of somewhere between 60 and 80,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war from Bataan to Camp O'Donnell. Prisoners were forced to march despite many dying on the journey. Transfer started April 9th after the three month battle of Bataan in the Philippines and people had to walk somewhere between 60 and 69 and a half miles. Psychologically though, the Americans score big on this one. The Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid doesn't really do any damage to Japan physically. Mentally it does, or psychologically. April 18th, 16 U.S. bombers raid Tokyo. Not much damage, but the locals the raid stunned the Japanese population because Japanese leaders promised that uh, the mainland would never ever be attacked. But there's also something else going on. Uh, the Americans uh, get some intelligence and they detect Japanese planes trying to see seize Port Mosby and uh, Talaga in the south, southern Solomon Islands. 
Also, there was the Battle of the Coral Sea, and that starts the turnaround for Americans. Early May, U.S. and Japanese carrier forces clashed in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Both sides suffered major losses. The U.S. Navy, though, checked a major Japanese offensive for the first time. The next battle is Midway, and the Americans win that one. Uh, it's a decisive victory. The battle takes place June 3rd through 6th. Uh, it's a successful defense of a major base located at the Midway Islands, and that dashes the Japanese hopes of neutralizing the United States Navy. The Battle of Midway effectively uh, would turn the tide of World War II in the Pacific. Meanwhile, in Europe, Stalingrad. Stalingrad, yeah, back in uh, Europe. The Russians are doing heavy lifting. They are doing all of the lifting in the battle against Germany. Uh, Germans um, had been marching through Europe since September 1st, 1939. But the Soviet Union forces launched a counteroffensive against the Germans at Stalingrad in mid-November. Uh, they quickly encircled an entire German army, more than 220,000 soldiers. The Battle of Stalingrad would eventually prove to be a decisive psychological turning point that ended the string of German victories and the Germans began to retreat westward. And then there's the uh, Battle of Milne Bay in New Guinea. Uh, the Battle of, of uh, Milne Bay, uh, the United States and Australia fight the Japanese in New Guinea. It's a 13-day battle, August 25th through September 7th. The Japanese forces attempt to attack Allied airfields, Milne Bay, but they didn't realize how many troops were there. Uh, the Japanese forces abandoned their attack, marking the first major battle in which the Allies defeated the Japanese in land battle. Then there's Guadalcanal. That starts September 13th. Japanese launch a major offensive against the Americans. There, suffer heavy casualties. By December 31st, 1942, the Japanese plan to withdraw their troops at Guadalcanal after suffering heavy losses. Uh, the battle would end in February 1943. My father-in-law served in Africa, North Africa. He's a member of the Single Corps. On uh, October 23rd, British forces attacked the German army at El Al Alamein in Egypt. On November 4th, the German army in North Africa is in full retreat after the defeat at uh, El Al Alamein uh, at the hands of the British 8th Army under General Bernard Montgomery. Meanwhile, there's a project going on at Columbia University. It's called the Manhattan Project eventually. And it's basically, let's see if we can build an atomic bomb. Let's see if we can do that. January 19th, Roosevelt authorized the Atomic Bomb Project. In June, the U.S. Uh, Army established the Manhattan Project to handle its part in the atomic bomb project and began the process of transferring responsibility from the Office of Scientific Research and Development to the military. In September, Lieutenant General Leslie Richard Groves Jr. was appointed director of what would become known as Manhattan Project. He selects J. Robert Oppenheimer to head the project's secret weapons laboratory. Back home, there's a terrible fire an absolute terrible fire in Boston. But because of Pearl Harbor, some people survive. And it's November 28th. Oh, it's a nightclub. Yes, a nightclub, the Coconut Grove Nightclub in Boston. One of the swankiest nightclubs became an inferno, trapping hundreds of victims as they jammed the club's exits. In less than 15 minutes, 492 people were dead, 166 injured making the blaze the deadliest nightclub act in night, nightclub fire in U.S. history. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. How many of you remember Casablanca? How many of you like that movie, huh? You like the movie. How many of you like the movie? This is just a kiss. Here's looking at you, kid. Rick Blaine, Humphrey Bogart's character, owns a nightclub in Casablanca, discovers his old flame Nilsa, Ingrid Bergman, is in town with her husband, Victor Lazo, Paul Hybrid. 
Lazarus of Fame Rebel. And with the Germans on his tail, Ilse Dos Rick can help get them out of the country of Morocco. Now I have a question for you for a second here. Let's see how many answers it. Play it again, Sam. Was Play It Again Sam part of Casablanca? I don't know. Yes, how many say that the, there was Play It Again Sam in the movie Casablanca? How many say no? What? I don't know what he said. Casablanca, the famous line, Play It Again Sam, was she that? Asked him to play it. She asked him. Okay, let's see if that ever happened. Said, play It Again Sam. It's a myth. He says, Rick, told you never to play that song. Yeah. Richard, Rick Blaine, Humphrey Bogart's mm -hmm. character, never says play it against Sam. No, she does. The line is not the movie. Ilsa, play it once, Sam. Mm -hmm. For old time's sake. Sam, the piano player. I don't know what you mean, Miss Ilsa. Ilsa, play it, Sam. Play no, as time shattered. goes by. Oh, it was never said in the movie. Never. Bambi came out in 1942. Bambi. Uh, this is not a feel-good movie, necessarily. Uh, Bambi was an animated drama film produced by Walt Disney. Based on the 1923 book, Bambi, A Life in the Woods, by the Australian author and hunter Felix Salton. The film was released by Howard Hughes, uh, RKO Radio Pictures, August 13th. The film did not perform as well as hoped because of the war. Disney could not get the uh, film into uh, the European market. Oh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Oh, How many times have you heard that song? Many, 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 many times. Written by a Jewish guy. Written by a Jewish guy by the name of Irving Berlin. You realize some of the best Christmas songs ever written were written by Jewish guys? Like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? That was written by Johnny Marks. Anyway, White Christmas is an Irving Berlin song reminiscing about an old-fashioned Christmas setting. Except his family was, was chased through Russia. They were Jewish. Uh, so he made it all up. Uh, the song was written by Berlin for the musical film Holiday Inn, uh, which has uh, something to do with Elvis, which I'll tell you about at the end. The composition won the Academy Award for Best Original Song at the 15th Academy Awards. The first public performance of White Christmas was on the Bing Crosby Craft Musical on Christmas Day in 1941. Didn't go all that well. The song initially performed poorly and was overshadowed by Holiday Inn's first big song, Be Careful, It's My Heart. Okay, and but by the end of October 1942, White Christmas topped the Your Hit Parade charts. How many of you listen to Your Hit Parade? <laughs> Stage Door Canteen. This was part, part of what civilians did during the war. It was started and directed by the American Theater Wing, War Service Inc. The first stage door cafe, canteen, canteen opened in New York on March 2nd in the basement of what was an empty 44th Street Theater. The canteen offered servicemen nights of dancing, entertainment, food, non-alcoholic drinks, and even opportunities to rub shoulders with celebrities all for free. Uh, there would be other stage door canteens, eventually in Boston, Washington, Philadelphia, Cleveland, mm -hmm. San Francisco, Newark, London, and Paris. Thanks for the memories. Bob Hope's first overseas trip was in 1942. Nine months after the United States entered World War II, Hope made his first overseas trip to entertain members of the armed forces to Alaska. Uh, then the U.S. territory, which required a special permit. The Nazis would track Hope, thinking if they bombed the area where Hope was in, they could take out several American uh, or Allied troops as well. This is where he went, Whittier. This is a clear day in Whittier. It's my wife, and uh, the fog is only down to here in Whittier. This is what Whittier generally looks like about 7 o'clock at night. The military put their, um, they put people there, also their payload in there, because you couldn't detect it, couldn't see it. It was always under fire. I mean, can you see anything in that picture? That's why they went there. Uh, Hope was offered a commission in the Navy as a lieutenant commander. 
However, President Franklin Roosevelt intervened, indicating it was best if Polk continued to entertain troops from all over the armed forces. There were two hockey teams in New York, National Hockey League teams, the Brooklyn Americans and the New York Rangers. Brooklyn Americans didn't really have an owner, had a lot of bills, and didn't have a place to play. They were going to move to Brooklyn, and more importantly, they didn't have any players, because most of the players in the National Hockey League, about 98% of them at that point, came from Canada, and they were involved in the war. So uh, they suspended operations with the hopes of coming back after the war. They never did. 1942 legacy. The greatest generation. They probably were the greatest generation. They grew up in the Depression, went off to war. Um, it was not until uh, January 27, 1944, that the US government told Americans about the Bataan Death March. Oh, by the way, how many of you were married to people who served in World War II? You were. Did your husband ever talk about World War II? Did he ever talk to you about? Anybody who had fathers in World War II? Because what you find, or what I have found, and many other people have found over the years, is that World War II veterans who served in Europe, who served in North Africa, who served in the Pacific, rarely ever talked about their experiences. They had a job to do, they did it, they came home, and got on with the rest of their lives, which is part of the greatest generation. September 1945, the Japanese commander of the Bataan Death March, uh, General Masahiro Hama, was arrested by Allied troops and uh, indicted for war crimes. February 26, 1946, he was sentenced to death by a firing squad, executed outside of Manila on April 3, 1946. Hitler committed suicide April 1945. Yeah. Germany surrendered May of 1945. Japan surrendered September 2nd, 1945, two weeks after or three weeks after two atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. FDR died on April 12, 1945 and never saw the end of the war. Soldiers came home, didn't talk much about the war. America's isolation policy ended. 1942 legacy, the wax and the waves. Uh, but there were problems, of course. At the end of the war, the uh, Navy established five separation centers for the uh, demobilization of the waves and for Navy nurses. Separation process began October 1st, 1945. Within a month, 9,000 of the waves had been separated by the end of 1946. 21,000 more had been discharged. The waves lasted until 1978. After World War II, the WACs had no legal uh, reemployment rights, no peacetime components, or even an inactive reserve. Without those rights, jobs for women would be scarce in peacetime. Congress provided reemployment rights for the WACs and WACs on August 9th, 1946. That woman's Humphrey Bogart's mistress, my old pal the late Verita Thompson. While he was married to Lauren McCall, she was taking care of him as well. Uh, she was uh, runner-up Miss uh, Arizona back in uh, around 1937, tried to be a movie star, didn't make it, so she did something else. She made wigs and did hair. She did Humphrey Bogart's hair. That's how they met. Bogey, bogey, and there she is when she's very young. She's very pretty. Uh, she also owned a bar in New Orleans called Bogies. She sold it to somebody named Jennifer Flowers. You ever hear of Jennifer Flowers? Jennifer Flowers, Bill Clinton's mistress, allegedly, took over the bar. Anyway, there she is in her Coco Chanel outfit, and that's Henry Mancini's piano back there. Anyway, Casablanca launched uh, Ingrid Bergman's career and established Humphrey Bogart as a romantic lead. It was uh, one of the most referenced films of all time, uh, from Woody Allen's Play It Against Sam to the Muppets. Walt Disney once said of Bambi, it's the best picture I ever made. Best ever to come out of Hollywood. Uh, Bambi, uh, well, it acknowledged that uh, there should be some animal rights, showed the fearless world which animals live in until the inevitable human intrusion. Time Magazine's review of Bambi. 
Disney's indictment of men who kill animals for sports is so effective that U.S. sportsmen who have seen the picture are gunning for him. Well, White Christmas is the greatest selling record of all time. Uh, it sold more than 50 million copies. Twice it was the number one hit in the United States on the Billboard chart. The other hit was The Choice by Chubby Checker. Uh, the song established that there could be commercially successful secular Christmas songs, market for Christmas songs. Um, before 1942, Christmas songs and films had come out sporadically and many were popular. Oh, Holiday Inn. How many of you stayed at the Holiday Inn? Yeah. In your life, right? Well, when this guy in Tennessee was thinking of putting together a hotel chain, his architect called it Holiday Inn. And that's how it became Holiday Inn. Elvis. Sam Phillips discovered Elvis in 1954-53 in Memphis at the Sun's studio, uh, Sun's recording studio. And he sells off Elvis and uh, he has Johnny Cash and Roy Orbison, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins. He doesn't make his money off of them. He invests in this small hotel firm called Holiday Inn and made a fortune of money. Made far more money off Holiday Inn than he ever did off of Elvis. Uh, the fire in Boston, how some people were saved. Uh, well, there was toughening of uh, building codes, but after the Pearl Harbor attack, the American government pumped money into Mass General in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, for burn research, because they were worried about guys getting burned uh, while fighting. Uh, so, there were blood banks and reserves of plasma on hand, which were critical to reviving uh, coconut grove burn victims. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memories. 1997, U.S. Congress honored Bob Hope by declaring him the first and only honorary veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. He did 48 Christmas shows. His final one, 1990, Operation Desert Storm, Saudi Arabia. Good old Humphrey Bogart's mistress, Verita Thompson, was a dancer. She went on one of those World War II tours with uh, Hope. She told me, she said, Bob Hope only demanded one thing out of you. Work as hard as the work as I do. And she said that Bob Hope was the hardest working guy she ever met in Hollywood. All you have to do to please Bob Hope is work as hard as he did. Well, baseball continued. Baseball continued with the green light letter, and uh, so did the National Football League and the National Hockey League. The Brooklyn Americans never came back. The next time the NHL and the teams was in 1967 or 25 years later. And we leave in Washington, D.C., the voice of America, still going strong. In 2022, the voice of America was used as a propaganda tool in the Russian Ukrainian uh, conflict, um, and it supplied a pro-American message to those uh, in Russia who could pick up the broadcast. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments? It's up to you now. Thank you.